to go ahead and join us. Feel free to share your slides, introduce yourself, and let's go ahead and get started. Thank you so much for being here. Oh, it's my pleasure. I'm very happy to be here. Um, my only slight issue is I am trying to share my screen and it doesn't have the button. Oh, here it is. I've seen the button. Sorry. You would no believe words. that after all of these years of all of this, I would be in a position where I would be able to be competent to share my own screen. However, clearly this is not the case. Um, let <laughs> me. I think um, we all go through the same thing. If I you seem need to be having. Um, would you like I me to share to be for having, you? I think we might. Oh, there we go. I've, my slides. Have, I had some sort of t update situation arising, but luckily the update situation has resolved itself. And now I can share my screen. So hello, everybody. Thank you for joining. It's a joy to have you all here. Um, and I'm going to talk about some medical issues related to MPOX. And hopefully I'll pick up on some of your questions. Um, I'm going to just do that. Um, so MPOX is in the family of viruses such as smallpox and the vaccine virus made uh, to eliminate smallpox and other animal related um, pox viruses. And they're really similar. And that's why you can actually use vaccines from other viruses to immunize against MPOX. Um, so I think um, that doesn't appear to be my actual slide deck, but never mind. Um, if we think about the timeline, what, what I would say to you is that um, in 1958, it was first identified in, in uh, monkeys, but actually the host is probably small rodents. And what you can see is it was going on in various uh, historically affected countries in Western and Central Africa. And suddenly the numbers really shot up around 2020. And the people, uh, the doctors and health workers on the ground were you know, informing people of their their increased known and suspected cases but unfortunately no help was forthcoming and therefore rather unsurprisingly of course uh, what happened is that there were multiple global outbreaks as we all know and that's because we are one uh, integrated world uh, and if something uh, happens uh, in one part of the world uh, the rest of the world is affected when one of one of us has a problem we all have a problem so currently, um, what we know, this is actually not my update slide deck, but anyway, I, I don't know how bad it's going to be. Um, I might, I think. Chloe, I would you press, like me yeah. to share, would you like me to share the slides yeah, you sent me? I don't quite know why this is the case. It's very odd. Um, let me see if I can find it or I'm really sorry, everyone. This is not normally so completely disorganized and chaotic. But unfortunately, this is what has arisen. You could do that, but can you hand over the um, can you hand it over to me afterwards? I will have to be able to I, hand over the control. No, I will have to advance for you. Okay, I've I've got the correct one. It's it's turned up now. Um, okay. Unfortunately, I had a massive disaster with my computer yesterday, and it rebooted, and everything went seriously wrong. And now I'm sort of paying the price. However. We are here now and we haven't had much of a delay. Um, so we know uh, who the outbreak has affected. We know that it's predominantly affected uh, the sexual networks of sexually active gay and bisexual men who have sex with men. But we've also reported on women who were a major source of concern at the beginning of the outbreak um, because people were concerned about spread to children, particularly and pregnancy, because um, there was evidence of, of worse disease in previous uh, historically affected countries. But we did a large case series and we actually found that very few women actually developed uh, MPOX non-sexually. And interestingly, in the homes of uh, the cis women, only uh, children were in the homes of about 25% of the cis women, only two got MPOX. So the concerns were uh, not actually uphold. Um, so, God, I'm having like quite a mayor here um so i guess the question is why and how has this all happened and i think one of the issues is that we know that there's increasing susceptibility with the waning of global immunity so as the smallpox uh, vaccine immunity goes down our risk goes up um and also the virus is actually very different so what's happened is that there's two clades 
and um, one happens has happened previously uh, in the Democratic uh, Republic of Congo in Central Africa, and the other clade is has happened predominantly in in Western Africa. And based on the outbreak that happened in Nigeria in 2017-2018, the virus has uh, changed and it has changed a lot. And you can see from the clay 2 virus, the A1 virus ha has, has massively changed and the B1 virus, all the different variants of the B1 virus are actually what we're seeing in this outbreak. And these are, we all know a lot more about viruses than we did. And what we know is that this is an or the pox virus, it's a DNA virus, so it shouldn't change as much as an RNA virus like COVID or HIV. But somehow, while this virus should have changed only a little bit in the space of this time, it's actually had about 50 mutations, and this is quite unusual and unexpected. And the changes are happening right at the ends of the, the, the sort of the sequence of the of the genome, and that's at the point where um, the virus gets its sort of what we call virulence. It's sort of really infectivity and sort of seriousness and also it's also the area that affects the uh, interaction with the human host so we think this might be explaining why this is everything is happening so differently so we all know what the associations were at the beginning um and um what we also know is that um case definitions um were expanded as a result of this to include uh the uh, particularly affected group, which was sexually active men who were having uh, sexual sex with men. And I guess there's been a lot of discussion about whether it's a sexually transmitted infection or not. And I think now there's much less debate. Uh, we found the virus in our large case series in 29 of the 32 specimens tested. Um, we found it uh, it's also subsequently been found to be vi viable. In other words, it's replicating and can be spread. Um, and it's also been found uh, in vaginal swabs in our global series in 14 out of 14 instances, suggesting that in, it is transmissible through sexual fluids, both uh, in uh, men and women. Um, and I think that um, what's clear is that the type of exposure is related to risk and exposure to skin and the anal rectum carries the greatest risk of transmission. But it's also possible to carry the virus without knowing. And there's evidence for asymptomatic carriage. There's evidence from uh, Amsterdam and from, from Belgium. Um, and what they found is that people who've been swabbed uh, have actually been asymptomatic, who've been going in for other reasons, have actually had positive PCRs. So it can be carried. And this explains really how it spread so much that people didn't have symptoms. Either people didn't have symptoms yet, um, or that they have very minor symptoms. And high concentrations of DNA were actually detectable up to four days before symptoms of the illness. And viral culture from anal samples prior to symptom onset has yielded a, a virus that can replicate. Uh, and you can see that in some case investigations, when they've looked at a, a pair of people who've definitely uh, contracted the virus from each other, you can see that pre-symptomatic transmissions occurred up to four days before the symptom onset. So clinically, we all, I think, know that things are very different to how they were uh, in the historically described disease, which is still occurring uh, in Africa. Let's not forget that. Um, so this is how it used to look with sort of many, many, many lesions, hundreds and sometimes thousands of lesions. And it often affected children. But what we've found is that although it was reported in the historical literature in that way and, and lesions were described like that, what we have found is that actually the disease is presenting very differently and the real findings are around genital and lesions, mucosal lesions, so in the internal skin of the mouth, the anus, the vagina, etc. Um, and it's also important to say um, that sometimes um, what we are seeing is that people are presenting to a lot of medical, different, different medical places because people didn't understand what was wrong and they were going to lots of different places. Most people had genital or anal lesions. Uh, this is in the early days of the outbreak when we did our first case series. But it's really interesting because I showed you those photographs of people uh, in historically affected countries with hundreds or thousands of lesions. What we see here is that two thirds of people had less than 10 lesions and 10% had a single lesion. And sometimes the lesions are really like a tiny patch of eczema. So you can see how somebody wouldn't know that they had any sort of a problem. The lesions um, 
occurred in multiple stages and many of them looked pussy. And the lesions occur close to the site of sexual contact. And I think we've realized this. So in people who have oral sex, um, they will get oral lesions, really bad tonsillitis, et cetera. In people who have anal sex, there'll be perianal or anal lesions um, and vaginal sex the same. So it's, it's pretty related to where the contact is. Interestingly, mucosal lesions are not what has been historically described, but they were a major part of this outbreak. And in many cases, people presented for the very first time with mucosal lesions. And also, um, because of this, misdiagnosis happened because people would see these lesions and think it was something else, like another sexually transmitted infection or some other cause of ulcers. And this was particularly the case uh, in women. Um, and what was actually found is at the beginning of the outbreak, lots of people were misdiagnosing people. And in a big survey, which I haven't published yet, but I'm, try I'm trying to get a paper together, about a third of doctors felt that they had misdiagnosed a case at the beginning. So in terms of complications, you've got local complications like uh, sort of abscesses. You can have pain in the anus, ulcers and perforation, as everybody will know. You can have the, the urinary retention and unable to pee because of this really, really severe swelling. You can get tonsillitis um, and you can get really bad eye problems. So, you know, of the cornea, you can get sort of ulceration of the cornea. And you can also get really big swelling of the whole uh, orbit of the eye. Um, there are sort of much rarer complications such as encephalitis, which is sort of inflammation of uh, the uh, fluid around the brain. Uh, myocarditis, inflammation of the heart, and due to the inability to pee, you can end up with dehydration. So what about HIV and MPXV? So in the CDC reported um, a data set, um, and they reported on disparities, um, which are very important uh, in terms of uh, racially minoritized communities, but they also reported of uh, in in about 3% of the, the cohort with CD4 counts less than 200. And they realized that they, those people would be more likely to have prolonged admissions and other rectal manifestations. Um, but it's important to recognize that 38 to 50% of people with MPOX are also living with HIV. Why would this be? Okay, Is it related to, to zero sorting? Is it due to the fact that people are well linked into care? Or is it related to the microbiome? So in Nigeria, prior to the outbreak, they found some worse outcomes in people living with HIV. Um, but we didn't find any differences in the early days of the outbreak. Um, the CDC did find something in 57 hospitalized people, and they found that in 47 people hospitalized with HIV, again, there were prolonged hospitalization and more disseminated disease. But recently um, at Croy, um, and published in The Lancet, I presented a cohort around uh, advanced disease with CD4 counts less than 200. Most people were from the Americas, that means both North and South America, some were from Europe. And what we found is that the majority of people were not newly diagnosed, only 8.6% were newly diagnosed, but 60% were previously diagnosed and on treatment, but only 50% were suppressed. And a large number, so 179 people, had CD4 counts less than 200, with a large proportion with CD4 counts less than 100. Now, what I find really shocking is that right at the bottom, and this has got nothing to do with advanced disease, but if you look at the vaccination in 2022, okay, we're talking about 382 people, okay, who are predominantly uh, men who have sex with men. 26 people received the vaccine at all, and 21 received it prior as a pre-exposure vaccination. Five received it as part of a treatment to prevent severe disease. That means we're really failing in terms of off our, our offer, in terms of reaching the people who need the vaccine most. What we found were really alarming findings, okay? And I have been criticized for using the word alarming, for, for, for using sort of, I don't know, alarmist language around this. Um, but I have to say that everyone who's seen these images has said the same, that it's really horrifying. And I think what's happened is that people have developed a very severe and disseminated form of MPOX with complications affecting not only the skin, but a range of organs. 
And with the skin, the lesions haven't stayed at the site of infection. They've spread all over the body and they've coalesced, they've joined together. Uh, and they are very, very severe lesions. And what's also happened is there were, you know, multiple organs affected. Uh, in terms of the deaths, what we saw is that there were 27 deaths. They all occurred with CD4 counts less than 200, okay, where the mortality is 15%. And it was 27% with CD4 counts less than 100. No one who'd received a vaccination died. So I think the point is that I'd like to make is that this is a very severe situation and the CD4 cut cutoff basically means it's a very familiar cutoff to many of us and it's what happens when you have an opportunistic infection. So MPOX is basically, MPXB is an opportunistic virus and it's causing an AIDS-defining condition. And the reason I want to, everybody to hear about this is because we all know that not everybody has had a test. And we know that not everyone is taking their treatment. And I think as a community, we need to support people who haven't had a test, who may be at risk of, of living with HIV without knowing it. And we need to support people who are not taking their treatment because there's now a virus out there, which is in humans. OK, it's going to be in humans. It's there's sustained human to human transmission. It, there's still numbers of cases every week. There are not a lot of cases, but it's there. And okay? we've seen what can happen when it spreads at big party events and People can live with HIV without showing any outward signs, okay? They can live for a period of time and then all of a sudden things start to go wrong. And people can live like this with low CD4 counts without being diagnosed before they become sick. And essentially what I'm saying is that people could end up, you know, not knowing about their HIV, getting MPXV and having a very severe outcome or dying. So this is why it's important. Not everyone received tecovirumet. A few people received it. They received multiple courses. It didn't work brilliantly. Uh, and very few people received pre-exposure prophylaxis. Um, and we did experience an iris situation where people reacted badly to uh, the treatment, the HIV treatment. I'm not saying people should not be treated for HIV at all. Okay. What I'm saying is that what happened to these people in this cohort is that people developed MPOX. They got sick. They were sick for 21 days. And then somebody started them on treatment by the time they were very unwell. And the MPOX flared up into an iris. I'm not saying that if you started people on day one, it wouldn't be helpful. I'm not saying that. So, because we don't know. But basically, if you find somebody with a, a, a you know, late diagnosis, that they really should uh, be monitored for sepsis and timing of treatment should be considered. So what we know is that there was a lot of behavioral change. We know that the reductions in sexual partners, one-time sexual encounters, uh, and reduction of sex partners on dating apps. Um, and we also know um, that we have these vaccines, the Gini also Invenax vaccine, which is a non-replicating vaccine, which needs to be given as two doses, 28 days apart, unless you've had a childhood vaccine, in which case you can have one dose. Um, the second dose is key. And you do, and for people living with HIV, the second dose is particularly key. And you can see that after one dose, you can see significant uh, improvements in protection. Um, and you can see how helpful it is to have the vaccine. Um, and you can also see the difference between vaccine effect uh, and behavioral change. So in unvaccinated people at the top, these were the rates between the time period of July and October. And for those that were vaccinated, you can see the rates were much lower. So even though lots of people changed behavior, the vaccinations gave an additional benefit. So what about treatments? We've got tecovirumab, which is approved for smallpox, but not uh, monkeypox uh, where I am. And it's available via an emergency access program. Uh, it's been shown to be safe so far, but we don't really know if it's effective. It possibly shortens the duration of the disease. But what I've learned at Croy is that you require an intact immune system to remove the virus which accumulates in the cell after treatment. And if you don't have that, it, 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 your immune system can't necessarily clear it. So it seems that TPOX requires some level of immunity, which explains why the people in the advanced case series kept on being treated with round and round and round of, of TPOX and, and not getting better, which suggests that IVIG, uh, IV immunoglobulins, might be a better option. Also, some people develop resistance. So it should be used for people who have lesions in sensitive or high-risk sites. 
um, very bad throat or rectal pain, many, many lesions rapidly progressing, or in people with immunocompromising conditions such as HIV or any other immunocompromising condition. And I always like to end on a point of activism, and I'm going to highlight the UK activists, but there are many activists all over the world. Um, and I'm going to highlight uh, my amazing uh, friend and colleague, uh, Haroon Tudene, who's done incredible work. And I'm also highlighting my colleagues at my own hospital on the right, together with Love Tank, uh, Will Nutland, who conducted a, a Black Pride event and actually managed to do a lot of vaccinating uh, during Black Pride. So I'm going to stop sharing. I'm so sorry about the, the chaos of my IT. I pride myself on being organized, but sadly, I had quite a bad uh, IT event yesterday, and it seems to have fried me and my brain and the computer. No worries at all, Chloe. We have all been there, and we will all be there again. The same thing happens no matter what. Um, the best laid plans, there's always something to mess that up. But your talk was beautiful. Thank you so much. We will take a few moments before we move on to Coletzo to have some follow-up questions. I'm going to read you a question from the QA. Uh, and again, if people want to raise their hand, you can go to the uh, under more and reactions and raise your hand and I can call on you live. But the question in the QA is this, since key populations often overlap each other, do you think it is necessary to de-silo STI and HIV care? I think that's a very, very wise question. And I do think that it's important to co-locate care. And it's something that we are trying to do in women more. But in the UK, in terms of sexual health and HIV, I'm afraid we are a couple of steps ahead of the US in the sense that we have had combined care for HIV and sexual health for the last, I don't know, 30 years. And the sexual health clinic is on the second floor and the HIV clinic is on the ground floor and they're completely integrated. And this is the case in the UK. Um, and unfortunately, public health cuts have made that a bit more tricky in some places, but in most places, it's combined care. And I do think it's essential. And I think that that has led to, you know, it's, it's led to really good outcomes. That's why our cascade of care in terms of HIV and 95, 95, 95, we've exceeded it. That's why, because we have joined up care. Yeah, it's really crazy. The United States is crazy how de-siloed it is and how disconnected and, and also how underfunded our STI clinics are, STI testing, STI treatment. It really makes no sense. Um, but I see uh, Ben Ryan has a question. Ben, if you want to come off mute and answer your, ask your question. Hey there, Professor Morgan. Good to see you. Uh, what do you think about the future likelihood or risk of major outbreaks sort of is an echo of what we saw last summer in the West. Hi, Ben, it's lovely to hear you. Um, so, do you know, I think it's really difficult because I think that I wanna answer your question, but during COVID, experts answered questions when they didn't know the answer and they predicted the future. And they predicted wrong and it caused a lot of misinformation and disinformation and lack of trust in medical experts. So I'm quite hesitant to actually give an answer because there was endless pundits saying what the future would hold and it didn't hold what they said. What I think is true is that the virus is now, they are sustained, they sustained human to human transmission in small numbers and in the right conditions and the right effects which probably means the party season, um, the pride season, there's no question that something like this could happen. But the question is, if the people who are at highest risk have already had MPXV, and if it is uh, lifelong immunity, then they will be sort of not likely to get it and, and to pass it on, nor will people who've been vaccinated. So it might be that the population at risk is, has got better immunity in well-resourced settings. This isn't the case in places where there is no vaccine, which is disgusting and appalling, but still the case. So I think we're one world and, you know, the, the, if it spreads in countries without um, vaccine, it, it will be a higher risk to everybody because not everyone has taken up the vaccine. 
So it's a very long answer. I think that there are there is potentially a case, at least one or possibly more cases of reinfection, convincing cases of reinfection. So that's another aspect. It's it's not likely, it's not common, but it's never been shown before with this type of virus, with an orthopox virus, has never been shown to cause reinfection. Immunity is supposed to be lifelong. As I've told you, the virus has mutated, it's quite different. And that may mean that this orthopox, this particular strain may not confer lifelong immunity, and then all bets are, are different. The other issue is that it's so far it has not established in outside of uh, historically affected countries in an animal reservoir, but that could happen. You know, we've it's been shown that it could infect a dog, it does affect other animals, it affects mammals. You know, if it establishes in an animal population, then it's a whole different scenario. And, you know, while it's circulating in humans, humans have contact with animals, you know, it's hard to know. So my answer is, I, I want to be a good scientist and tell you what I know and what I don't know. So I'm sorry, that's not the answer, a complete answer to your question, but it's the best I'm able to do. Thank you for the question, Ben, and thank you for the answer, Chloe. Um, I'm going to take a question from the chat, and then we're going to take a live question from patient advocate, and then we'll move on to Coletso. In the chat, there was a recent report of documented reinfection. Is this an exception that proves the rule, or will we see more reinfection? Yeah, I mean, this is one the one case that people are talking about, but I can tell you as a person who's pulled together these large case series, people all over the world contact me constantly, and this is not the first one I've heard about. So I don't think it's a single case, that, that I can tell you. Um, it's, not, it's not a single case. Thank you, thank you. And uh, for our last question, before we move on to Coletso, patient advocate, go ahead. Hi, good morning. Um, and I understand the focus of today's webinar is about MPOX, but I understand we also should be approaching sexual health from a syndemic approach, looking at all STIs that are important and can be um, co-infected and contributing to infection of one another or driving infection of one another. So I just wanted to ask, you know, in terms of MPOX, um, the, you know, global emergency and outbreak, there were less than a thousand cases at peak in the U.S. last summer, um, yet genital herpes spreads without public health intervention and nearly 50,000 cases a month in the U.S. Um, it has no effective treatment, there's no cure, and it's a widely recognized driver of new cases of HS HIV. Um, so I'm just curious, you know, what sexual health advocates and HIV advocates think about this and why, um, or why people are not more concerned. Um, Thank you for your thanks question. Thanks for that. I, I mean, basically, uh, HSV is a virus um, which, can, you know, genital and oral herpes happens. There are treatments which are effective, they are antiviral treatments. Um, any sexually transmitted infection, syphilis, gonorrhea, chlamydia, HSV, all drive transmission of other viruses. Um, and uh, in most people, HSV is a, a minor condition, a mild illness, which is self-limiting. Um, and it, it can be treated with acyclovir, valacyclovir, um, so it, it, there's no cure, but there's many diseases for which there's no cure, but there are intermittent treatments. There's also suppressive therapy, which can be given uh, daily, which will suppress infections. Um, so I think that's what I would say. Virus, which causes neurological complications um, and can... Rarely. It does, yes. Very rarely, but yes, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, patient advocates. Thank you, Chloe. Um, Chloe's going to stick around for more Q&A after when we have, uh, after we conclude um, Coletso's comments. So Coletso, if you'd like to come on, I'm going to uh, invite you to share your screen, introduce yourself, and we look forward to hearing your talk. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. And um... Uh, I I want to say, give a little bit of an account of what we how we responded to MPOX in New York City in community, and then um, give a little bit of data that came from that response. We we're mainly concerned with uh, uh, gaps in data when we kind of started thinking about MPOX. But I'm going to try and tell the story chronologically. 
so we heard about this uh, this event uh, tearing through Europe, and it was very strange. James Crellenstein and I, we didn't know each other before that. We knew each other on Twitter, but we got into a Twitter exchange, and eventually he called me and you know said, you know, I I think something big is coming, uh, is going to sweep through. You know, but no one was panicking at the time. No one was acting as if it's this huge event about to happen. So we had this feeling of uh, kind of being crazy, feeling crazy. And either you kind of raise the alarm with the risk that nothing happens and everyone was saying it'll peter out, you know, because that's what had happened before. Um, so either you raise the alarm and you're right and great, or you raise the alarm and you're wrong. And that's kind of what we're faced with. And we kind of decided to go ahead and start speaking to people about it. And this is one of the first things we did together is we published this New York Times article because he had been involved in the COVID response. And there were certain things that failed in COVID that seemed like they, they might fail again in MPOX, like the testing platform that uh, was gonna be used for, for, for MPOX testing. Um, that was around my graduation. There I am pictured answering the call of duty. Um, I was traveling for graduation uh, kind of when things started intensifying. And the context we had then was that we had this novel infectious disease, novel in the idea that it presents differently than it's been uh, shown to before. Uh, there were no plans that we knew of to collect additional data in the community, which means the default would be to collect data in the clinic which uh, I know because I've worked in uh, HIV among men who have sex with men for a while, that there is a massive selection to the clinic. So there's many people don't get to the clinic or at least access is so skewed that you might develop the wrong picture about what's going on if you depend on the clinic. And in New York, they were testing 15, 20 people a week, which is absolutely in the scale of that city. It doesn't make sense. And we were coming into the summer. So we, we had the sense that uh, we were going to have challenges with data. At the same time, we knew that there wasn't enough vaccine to cover everyone. So we anticipated that there'd be some kind of rationing decision coming and that we, it would be better to have more information for that decision than less. And then the last thing was uh, what usually happens in these kinds of outbreaks is that uh, outreach resources are deployed to venues where people have public sex, but uh, or public venues where people have group sex. But technology has changed over the last, I would say, decade um, so that it's much easier to form a group privately. You don't have to go to the cock or the eagle or whatever. And so one of the things, one of the questions that we had was whether uh, what what group sex looks like in the city and and so how can we respond to that picture rather than the picture that we developed kind of starting in the 90s about how to respond uh, in an acute situation. The first, so we decided, okay, so let's make a study, let's kind of collect some data on at the very least uh, people's experiences of monkeypox like symptoms and then secondly on how group sex happens in the city. And we figured we'd have to do it quickly so that we can get the data out in time for it to go into the decision making about the vaccine. In the US, things, of course, took a turn and we didn't end up having to ration the vaccine in the way that we thought. We, we rationed it at the dose level, not at the individual level. Um, but at the time, we were thinking, OK, so we're going to get to this uh, period where we need the data. So we need the survey to be taken really quickly. So we got, uh, the first thing we did is we uh, had a call with Burness, a marketing agency. This was thanks to Nick Diamond, who's on the call and he's an investigator as well. And he's my husband, but that does not uh, skew my opinion in any way. But uh, so he led this part of the work to deal with Burness. And we basically said, hey, we're running the study. We're going to need a good name. We're going to need a good design because it's for uh, gay and bi men and it has to be quick and it has to be something that people feel like they want to participate in. We didn't have any money. We just kind of showed up and we asked them to give us a plan for uh, 5,000, 10, 20, 50, 100, something like that. So a few options uh, so that we could raise money as we were, as they were developing work. So they sequenced things so that they would do uh, for example, they would do the um, the idea of the campaign, the 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 
the kind of the creative direction of the campaign first. And that would take like $20,000, the first amount. And then they would build the actual assets that go online that would take another amount. And then would be advertising that would be the last amount. So we were trying to raise funds uh, in sequence as, as, they were, as they were working. Um, and because, you know, we, I, I don't have an NIH grant and the, the timeline for those things is quite long. We had to really do um, creative things to raise money. One thing we thought we could do is be in the press a lot um, and talk about the study and then uh, invite people to make private donations, which is, it's unusual to, to fund a study through private donations, but we're trying to do it quickly. So we're trying everything. So I entered this crazy period of uh, just doing any media interview that seems legitimate, that the person seems neutral um, or at least curious and uh, trying to get the word out. At the same time, I think um, I realized that because this event is about sex, it's about group sex, which is not normative, it's about gay and uh, bi men, um, that there was a real risk that the storytelling about mpox, monkeypox at the time, would uh, would be tied up with people's disgust and people's judgment of these sexual behaviors that they don't understand. So, so my objective, uh, my other objective in doing all this media was to try and frame the conversation of how to respond and what's happening in a way that recognizes that people are having the sex, we can't pretend that it's not happening, but we can't pretend that the sex itself is the problem. The problem is that there's a pathogen which is spreading through this configuration of people who are having the sex that they want to have. So uh, it was a very busy period uh, trying to kind of get key messages across and trying to get out a uh, study, uh, word about our study. We also, um, there were like four, three or four of us when we started, but we realized there was a lot of work coming. So we kind of opened up so that anyone could join us and, and uh, work with us on the study and join as an investigator. So there were no uh, volunteers who didn't have uh, a stake in this process if they don't want to. The investigator team is still meeting. We make collective decisions about what to do with the data, um, et cetera. But at the core of uh, our study is um, an innovation in measurement. It's not completely new. I've seen a group that did something similar, but it was 10 years ago. Um, and the innovation is to measure where people have group sex and where people live um, in a way where, in an easy way. So this is, this is what the interface looks like. The user taps and then it will say, okay, you've tapped there. You've indicated that you've had group sex there. What kind of place is it? Did you have sex there? How frequently do you go there, et cetera? So this allowed us to uh, build a picture that I'm gonna show you of the, 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 the spatial epidemiology of uh, sex in New York City. And the reason that was important was because we were going to ration vaccine. And so it was important to figure out if we're gonna target a particular subgroup or a particular place, which subgroups and places should we target to be most effective at uh, disrupting the transmission network across the city. The so we had this idea about what the instrument is going to look like. Uh, besides funding, a really big preoccupation right at the beginning, for me at least, was to consult quickly enough. Because a lot of us, I'm, I'm new to New York City. I've worked in, uh, in HIV and sexual health for a long time, but I haven't worked in the city. And uh, we had the sense that if we just fly in, come up with this big initiative, um, we run the risk of alienating people and meeting resistance, and we just run the risk of not understanding what we're doing. So a lot of emphasis was put on consultation. Uh, we had a team within our investigators who basically came up with lists of people and figured out who knows the people on the list and had the people who knows them contact the people on the list to get them into a room. Finally, we got into a call and uh, we things shifted a little bit in the way that I explained. But the main, uh, I, I think the three things that came out of that consultation process that shifted things for us. One is we started as an English only survey. 
Um, and in the course of consulting, it was clear that we need to add Spanish. That was a request from uh, some of the participants. And then the other thing, the second thing was that we started with this frame of cisgender, of gay and bisexual men. Of course, the cisgender is silent. Um, based on what we were hearing about the cases that had been coming through Europe, the cases that were reported at the World Health Organization, and kind of uh, after the first few cases here, and when they started talking about the identities of the patients who was getting uh, MPOX here. And uh, uh, one of the participants of this consultation that we had really uh, criticized that strongly and pointed out that we don't actually know what is happening among trans people. Um, we do know that trans people are embedded in sexual networks that include uh, cis uh, people, uh, but we don't know what's happening with monkeypox specifically. So we had so we shifted the frame to include queer and trans people to measure among trans people and not to alienate them in the language that we use uh, to advertise the survey so that we could understand if there is a big problem or not. So the, what happened when we started consulting for our purposes, for the purpose of the study, is that we figured out that um, the, the folks who were in the room didn't have another place to come and talk about MPOX regularly, to get an update on the epidemiology, to get a sense how different organizations are seeing it happen among their memberships. Uh, to, uh, to learn more, we didn't know whether it was sexually transmitted or not, you know, to learn about it as it's emerging. So what started as a consultation mechanism became a coordination mechanism. We, we just kept that call going. Most of the content wasn't about the study, it was about MPOX, uh, but we held that space so that, that that coordination could happen at least until another mechanism came up. And, uh, but anyway, so that happened. I'm gonna, I lost my train of thought just for a second. I'm gonna come back to that thought of what happened in that transformation. One big piece of consultation that we did though, the third one was to decide what kind of uh, campaign to run. So these were four options that were given us, given to us by Berness. They were presented to us in the context of this uh, community forum, which had begun as a consultation forum, but became a coordination forum and uh, basically decided how the campaign should look and feel. And that decision had a lot to do with how people would interpret the images. So this one is obviously about the signs people use to communicate to each other about sex. Uh, this one was responding particularly to our idea that we should have a more expansive idea of uh, the people who are affected, possibly affected by MPOX. We ended up going with this one. Um, and so we started with the problem of funding. A lot of it was private donations. We got about $16,000, but there are also a couple of organizations who gave different things. Prep for All uh, gave, uh, some investigators are at Prep for All, leaders at Prep for All, and they have uh, offered administrative support. When AMFA offered funding to support the marketing materials, it was $20,000. And we need to start immediately. And I went to my university and I said, look, we got $20,000. Now we can start working. At the university, it was like, wow, you know, first the people who do grants should have been engaged before you even started speaking to AMFA. And then we go through this whole process and then the university must take its cut. And then you can get to programming with the money. So it was a very involved process that was just completely out of sync with what was happening. So Prep for All ended up receiving the funds from AMFA and passing them on to Berness. Um, Grinder offered uh, free advertising. I'm at the FXB Center. They offered some money. Um, so we kind of cobbled together a, a, a package to support what we were doing from these different sources. So the salience of this transformation from a, a consultation forum to a coordination mechanism was that we started seeing people in the uh, who are who regularly attend these meetings do projects together as subgroups. Uh, these are the projects that mainly investigators did as participants uh, in the community forum that they we work together to do some things but there are others that aren't listed here so uh, for example there was one of us uh, designed a vaccine locator because the communication about how to find vaccination was so poor 
uh, there was there were two kind of uh, policy briefs, one to city and state, one to federal. Uh, this was a guide on how to care for yourself once you have MPOX. That information wasn't really readily available. And then this one was really important because it was uh, thinking through how to have safer sex in the context of MPOX based on what we know about MPOX and what we know about how people uh, want to have sex. So some really important work that did shift how things uh, played out in MPOX came out of just bringing people together who are concerned about a problem and letting them uh, brainstorm ways to deal with the problem together. So one thing we've been thinking now, reflecting on this experience is uh, how to then conceptualize uh, an emergency response to an outbreak that is community led that obviously includes uh, the government and other other bodies that have resources that are necessary to mobilize in such a response, but that really uh, centers the community's perspective. And so we're in the process of trying to develop that and work on it together with, with uh, collaborators outside the group. But basically what I think happened is we there were four components. One was consultation. You really need to understand the visuals that you're gonna use, the language that you're gonna use, uh, the ideas that you use to understand what's happening, you need to check that uh, that resonates with people who are who have been doing the work, uh, or people who are interested, or people who are affected. Uh, it's important to think about resourcing. It's important for uh, work that community does to be supported financially. Um, surveillance is important because we know that the data that come out of routine systems like clinical services. Um, are skewed, it's important to think about whether you need to collect new data and how to collect it and what to collect. And then finally, there is a, an, it's necessary to have a way of coordinating different organizations, different people uh, working on the same projects, but they're not contained in any single organization. So it's important to have some kind of way of coordinating action. And all these, these four ideas are not new. I think uh, they, I made decisions, uh, we made decisions together that were strongly influenced by all our experiences. And my experience up to now has been in civil society work in global health and uh, the principles that guide that work, common practices like convening people and like making task forces, committees, et cetera. Um, so that those ideas shaped the response in, in, in New York. And that's important to say, because I think in global health, uh, because it is uh, kind of a vestige of an older way of, an older colonial way of being in the world, global health is usually people in the global north uh, teaching people in the global south. And in this case, I think it's uh, work from the global south that really shaped what's happening in the global north, because a lot of the content of uh, these guidances that, that I'm putting here as examples of where you can find the principles that guided the work, a lot of those uh, principles and those practices come from uh, people, practitioners in the global south who work in uh, LGBT organizations. Okay, uh, Jim, should I pause or should I... Uh, just get through and then we'll do questions at the end. Thanks, Colette. So I think, uh, I think you're doing great. There are some questions coming in, but let's uh, let you finish your comments and then we'll have plenty of time for QA. So go ahead. Okay. So now I'm going to show some preliminary uh, results from the survey, just so uh, <laughs> uh, you all understand why we did this crazy thing. Uh, so from the moment we had the idea to kind of the first analyses, it took six months, which I think is very short for a study. Um, but here are some of the insights that uh, that came from. Well, first, just a description of what we have in the survey. About 1,500 respondents, Many, most of them came through Grindr ads. So it's people who hook up um, mainly. 40% uh, of them reported having had group sex or extended physical contact within the past four weeks. And then from those 40%, we asked them to show us on the map where they had group sex, what kind of place it was, et cetera. And those 40% yielded 700 places that I'm gonna analyze. 
And here are five things that uh, you can glean from this uh, data so far. One is that most group sex happens in private residences, not public venues, as, uh, as I had thought coming in, which means if you build your strategy for response around the eagle, the cock, public sex venues, you're gonna miss a majority of where the action is. Um, the second, which is maybe obvious to people who are queer and trans, but not necessarily everyone else, is that uh, uh, queer and trans people are clustered across the city, not evenly distributed across, because there are neighborhoods that are better, safer, have more infrastructure, have more fun th things to do for queer, queer and trans people. Uh, but not all queer and trans people are clustered in the same ways. So uh, Black people, as you can tell here, are clustered in this uh, neighborhood, which is Harlem. And over here, my New York geography is not that good, so please forgive me. Uh, you know, so anyway, the point is that even though overall there's a clustering of queer people, it's important to understand how different subgroups cluster so that you don't miss, uh, you don't end up intervening in a way that disadvantages one group over another. The third point is that you can think of the communities as a network where each of these dots are uh, these communities. So the green dots are Manhattan, orange dots are Queens, et cetera. And the connections between these communities are people who have had uh, group sex in both communities. So this line indicates that at least one person had group sex here and here. So we have an understanding of how these places are connected so that we can understand which places are more central uh, than other places. But thinking of it as a network means you can divide up the network into proportions that are more connected to each other. So take these four nodes, for example. They are connected much more densely with each other than they are connected with these two dots over there. So you could say this is one community uh, where people, where these venues exchange uh, participants of group sex, and then maybe these two comprise another community. So instead of using uh, the boroughs or using neighborhoods or something artificial and kind of human created like that, you can use patterns of how people have group sex in the city to divide the city up into different districts so that you know if there is transmission in this purple region, it's more likely to spread to the purple region than to the yellow and the pink region. So you want to contain it there um, as, as much as you can. That's point number three. Point number four is that uh, there are some destination communities that are popular across uh, the whole population and across different subgroups. So what I mean by that is this is a map of where people live. Those people who said they'd had group sex. This is where they live. This is where they had group sex. So you can see that all three groups uh, kind of uh, come to group sex around this area, they concentrate in these two neighborhoods here. This is another picture which is similar. This one asks, if I camped out in this neighborhood for four weeks, what proportion of the sample would I get? And if the sample is representative, what proportion of the community of people who have group sex would I meet if I camped out at this one spot? So what you see is that, uh, and the dark pink is, this is where I would get the first third of people in the sample. The light pink is where I'd get the second third in the sample. And then the third third would be spread across the whole, the, the rest of the city. So uh, you can get kind of the first 33% of people, Latinx, black and white, by just uh, covering these two communities. So that's great. It means we don't have to do have different, uh, approaches for this first third of people. But for the second third of people, um, the, the places where you would need to be to reach those folks are different across different subgroups. So this place, for example, is not common to Black, Latinx, and white people. Only Black people have that place in common. Black and Latinx people have this place in common. Uh, only white people have that place in common. So if you're going to respond spatially, you have to have a strategy for reaching people in these very popular communities. And then you're gonna to have to also build strategies for reaching different subgroups where they have group sex.
So if that seems hopeless, the nice thing about uh, using public sex venues to intervene is that people come to the public sex venues, you don't have to hunt for people in their homes. So now I'm saying public sex venues aren't sufficient, people are having sex in residences. So how do we find people in their residences? One approach that we've been thinking about is to use subway stations in New York City, just because everyone has to use the subway. And just like in the past picture, in the past picture, the first third is in these dark ones, the second third in the light ones. In this picture, you can reach the first third of people by camping out in these subway stations. And then the second third in these lighter subway stations. So again, there's some stations that are common across the three groups, but if you wanna reach them equitably, you're gonna to have to pick different complements of subway stations and camp out at them and perhaps uh, modify the language and the visuals that you use to uh, target the people that you think you're gonna find at the station um, that you're at. So this is preliminary. It's just a, a, a way of opening the conversation of next time there's an emergency, how are we going to A, figure out where transmission is happening quickly and B, figure out how to position ourselves to reach people who are most likely to be um, caught up in uh, networks of transmission. Thank you, and that's it. Wow, Coletto, that is, uh, someone just said this is amazing work and I, I, I have to agree, I think uh, so fascinating and really thank you for walking through the entire process. Um, from conceptualization to where you are now. I think, uh, I think I'm not the only one who has really appreciated that. Um, we do have a number of questions. I'm gonna just start, I'm gonna start with a hard one for you, Coletto. <laughs> See if you can do this, uh, sorry if I'm catching you off guard, but I'm gonna ask you to, what's your elevator speech on your talk? So you're in an elevator with someone really important. It's going down five floors, you have 20 seconds. What are your takeaways from your talk today that you would want that person in the elevator to remember? Because you gave us a lot of juiciness. I wanna, what's the so, nugget? Yeah, you don't have to fly blind when you respond to an outbreak. It's possible to collect information on where the outbreak is possibly happening and prioritize on the basis of that. And you, it's possible to engage community every step of the way and work quickly because we did it. Awesome. And the door is opened and I've walked out with a wonderful nugget. Thank you. Uh, so I'm going to go through some questions that came into the QA. Uh, please go ahead and raise your hand if you want to ask a question live. We would love to hear other voices. So um, please consider what your question may be. We have about 20 minutes, so we have plenty of time. Some of these I think are probably more for Chloe, but please both jump in uh, if you have things to add. Um, the first one is, so if someone has had MPOX, do they need a vaccine? That's an excellent question. Um, I don't think the science is there, but I think that given the reinfection, I don't think it's going to harm you to have a vaccine. Um, and I think it may be protective. Because if, if this virus is, if there are reinfections, it could be you. So and I think there have been some reinfections. I don't think that, you know, it would be an, an issue to have, have a vaccine. Thank you for that, Chloe. Uh, is there an association between the root of acquisition of MPOX and the severity of disease? Um, I think that, I think the people who've had no, nose disease, eye disease, mouth disease have had pretty bad times. People haven't been able to swallow, have been admitted for that. So I think, I, I don't, I, I think that the, the type of contact determines where the lesion is. And I imagine that the, the load, you know, the infectivity of the person uh, who the person got it from would have been quite impactful. So I think I think immunity is very important. The host immunity of the person is important in determining the outcomes. I don't know if that makes any sense. I think it does so, make sense. Someone's and, uh, commented that the CDC doesn't recommend vaccination if you've had MPOX. I think 
the thing is, I, I think the bottom line is that things change when when data come, and we've had our first proper report of reinfection, and we'll see what happens now as people are empowered by their presentation to uh, publication to submit their own data. Thank you. And, and so this question would probably go for both of you and considering your, your backgrounds and um, perspectives. So I'll read this. Uh, do you think the illegality of male-to-male -male, uh, same-sex sexual contact, contact in many countries in Sub-Saharan Africa is a barrier to disclosure during medical consultations and to research about sexual orientation, making it challenging to establish sexual transmission of MPOX? Yeah, and that's what happened. I think that, in, I mean, Coletta, I know that you're going to want to answer as well, but um, that's certainly what happened to Demir Goyner, Professor Demir Goyner from Nigeria, um, who's what who's the world expert on MPOX, in my opinion. And he did his very best to sound the alarm and to tell the, the academic community that um, he thought that there were heterosexual transmissions and that there was transmitting in, in young men in urban settings and nobody listened to him um and he thought there was sexual transmission he wrote it up so and i think that there are problems in disclosing uh, obviously in places where homosexuality is criminalized people don't want to disclose their uh sexual sexuality um it's not only in africa just to be very clear there's lots of other countries where uh homosexuality is is criminalized don't know what i'm laughing at as a as a gay person but anyway um I, I think I don't know why I'm smiling at that point but I think um I, I think that it, it of course it makes it more difficult because if you can't have a you know an honest conversation because it's too too unsafe for you um it's hard to do surveillance it's hard to offer protection it's hard to do contact tracing you know it's very hard to contain an outbreak that you don't understand hmm. Would you I, like I would, to add to that? Go ahead, Kaletso. Yeah, Sorry. no, I would agree. I, I think, uh, yeah, I think I would I would agree with this. I would say yes. I would answer yes to the question. It it makes it more difficult when there's criminalization. But I'd, I'd say two things. One is that um, MPOX, severe cases of MPOX are so painful that I think uh, we would have heard through community-based organizations if there were problems like in North America, Europe, and Latin America, if that was happening in Africa, I think I think we would hear it. So in some ways, MPOX, I don't think there's the same epidemic in Africa as there is uh, in these in these regions. The second thing is I, I think that we have a tendency to index the environment for uh, queer and trans people, but let's say gay and bi men in particular, to index the severity or the uh, kind of how how well the environment treats these people through whether or not people can get married and whether or not uh, same-sex sexual conduct is criminalized. And I think that those two things hide a lot of variation. Kenya has same-sex sexual conduct criminalized, um, but is one of the most vibrant places, which actually was an inspiration for how to organize our own response in New York. Civil society there is flawlessly organized. They're connected with each other. They know that the government's going to fail, so they're not surprised by it, which is <laughs> a thing that I think we're still struggling with here in the U.S. So, um, yeah, so the question of whether criminalization makes things worse is important, but I think we have to expand our ideas about what are the salient things that shape the environment for, for gay and bi men. Thank you for both of your really thoughtful and considered answers, uh, mm -hmm. much appreciated. Um, what, is, what does it look like for women who have sex with women? Are they as susceptible as, susceptible as other populations to MPOX? What, what do we know about this uh, community? Well, not a lot, really. Um, there was almost like one or two people in the whole women's case series that we saw. Um, and those women also had sex with men. Um, so I, I think the bottom line is if the, if some if a woman by any chance, any reason had 
vaginal or vulval disease and they had contact or oral sex with a woman, there's no reason that it wouldn't transmit. You know, it's in the vaginal fluids, it's on the vulva, it's about sexual contact, so it would spread just the same, basically. Um, someone's asked a really interesting question, Jim, if you don't mind my... Yeah, please, go it. ahead, go ahead. Um, someone's commented that COVID vaccines may not work as well if a person had COVID first. Could this explain, or well, now somebody else has written a long post, could this explain <laughs> MPOX reinfection, that the vaccine doesn't work as well after an infection? Yeah, so you're talking about sort of immune priming. Um, it's difficult, difficult to say. Um, it, I think what that's about it, in, in printing, immune imprinting, is that, that what that means is that your first contact with some completely new pathogen is what your immune system remembers and anything that's slightly different from that, different enough to cause an infection, your immune system can't contain. Um, I mean, I mean, my personal view is that people should have vaccines for this to prevent this. And that if you've had MPXV, I think there's no data either way to suggest either way but I would still suggest that people are, are careful if they potentially could be at risk of, of getting mpox it's not pleasant but it is can at times be so mild that you wouldn't know you had it and that is scientifically proven so you may not know you have it so I think it's important to do it thank and you I, and let me go just, ahead Calypso I'm just gonna put my epidemiologist hat on just for a second yeah please do um I, I think what I also heard in that question is the idea that um, vac so vaccine works less well among people who are who had already had uh, the pathogen. If that comes from a study that compares people who are vaccinated with people who are not vaccinated and see how much monkey uh, whatever outcome they get, and you compare them, then what happens is if if you compare unvaccinated to vaccinated and the unvaccinated have never had the disease, the gap between those who are vaccinated and those who have not vaccinated is huge. But if you look, if you compare vaccinated to unvaccinated who have the disease, among the unvaccinated who have had the disease, the chance of them getting the disease again is much lower. So the vaccine might have the same effect on the body, but just because you're comparing with a population that's less likely to have whatever outcome you're talking about, it's going to look like the vaccine is less effective. So even in phrasing the question, it's important to distinguish kind of what you think the vaccine is doing to the body versus the studies that you're looking at and who they're comparing, which two groups they're comparing. Thank you. And Jill says, ah, thank you. So thank you both for that uh, answer. And while I, I'm going to really encourage someone, someone brave uh, in this group to raise your hand and ask a question or make a comment live, but before, while you're summoning up that bravery and that comment, um, do either of you have any data regarding MPOX and sex workers? Yeah, I mean, we have, we found that in the women's study, um, we did find that um, the trans women were more likely to be doing sex work, and there were lots of other indicators of social precarity that they were experiencing um but the, the disease was similar it depended on the type of sex that people had now um since we are sort of having a slight lull um i'm going to invite you all to a public lecture which is my professorial inaugural lecture uh, which will be given on the 14th of june it'll be uk time 5 30 so some of you in the us will be awake <laughs> and I've invited um, my close friends and family to be present uh, and colleagues in London. Um, but I'm inviting um, everyone to join online and you can register. And I've just put the link in the chat. And I'll be talking about HIV, activism, MPOX uh, and equity in general. Oh, my God. That is so amazing. We all got this personal invite. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. And please much, don't Chloe. tweet it yet because I'm going to tweet out my own invitation to people later in the day. But for now, I'm inviting this lovely audience. <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much. And congratulations. It's, it sounds very exciting and a few months away. Uh, ah, I see Devin 
from Ontario has a question or comment. Go ahead, Devin. Hi, Jim. Uh, thanks to Callisto and Chol for the, I, I've said CRY conference. So it's a poster actually that talked about, it's a small study of nine folks and I think two people are HIV positive. And one of them only had a vaccine uh, and I'm not even sure if they had two vaccines, but uh, the poster basically talked about after three months after MPOX uh, infection, they found detectable immunoglobulin G and neutralizing antibodies. And basically, it's like there's a possible protection of immunity after. Is this something that we can generalize for folks, or is this like a, just a small? I don't think we can really generalize anything at this time. I think it's all new. We're learning about it. Um, we're learning about it in different context. Um, the virus, the, the vaccine should provide neutralization and protection, and there's evidence of that, and it's early evidence. But I think we just have to watch and wait. I know we all hate doing that. But I think we have to watch and wait. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Devin, for the question. So another question from the QA. Um, what is the influence, and this is a big question, I think. What is the influence of HIV infection, other STIs, and immunosuppression on MPO MPOX acquisition, transmission, and clinical progression? Well, clinical progression, I think I've answered. Um, it can cause very severe disease in people with CD4 counts less than 200. Acquisition, we don't know whether people living with HIV have been more likely to acquire HIV related to serious sorting, sexual behavior, or whether it's just that they people with mild disease have been diagnosed because they are attending sexual health clinics for testing. We don't know these answers. Um, and we don't know, uh, we don't know about uh, acquisition. Well, I don't. And did you want to add anything with one of the hats you wear, Coletzo? No, I, I also don't know, I'm, I'm afraid. And I think it's really important to hear really smart people say they don't know and that this work is ongoing and we're trying to uncover it. So uh, I think that is really important and I appreciate you both for doing that. Uh, I asked this of Coletzo before, and we're going to do some wrap up comments, uh, but I'm going to ask you now, Chloe, you're in the same elevator that he was in. It's going down five floors. You don't have a lot of time. There's someone in there who you want to get uh, the most important nugget or a very important nugget out of your talk today. What do you tell them? Um, I would talk about HIV and advanced disease and MPOX, because I think that's the most important thing. It's a life-threatening illness. It's a new AIDS-defining condition. People need to be very aware of having a test. There's something that every person can do for every other person, and that's encourage people to have a test, encourage people to keep taking their treatment if they're on treatment, encourage people to engage with care because people are at very high risk. And the other thing I would say is if you're invited to participate in a clinical trial of any sort, and you're able to try and say yes, because the more data we have, the more we'll be able to answer these questions. Thank you for that, Chloe. So I'm gonna to go to Coletzo and then uh, close with Chloe or ask you both the, to answer the same question. Um, as we all leave this webinar today uh, with the various hats we wear and the various organizations we work and the various countries and contexts all over the world, 34 countries represented today in the registrations for this webinar. What is something that we can each do to uh, address MPOX uh, in our communities and in our contexts? Regardless of sort of where we sit and what we, you know, what hat we wear. And I'm gonna, I, I, I'll start with Coletzo. Um, I think, hmm, I think everyone can figure out in their context how they're gonna respond if there is an outbreak in the summer. So if the worst happens and we have and this again, this confluence of networks and travel and uh, higher rates of contact um, and uh, mixing with people who are entirely unvaccinated and knowing that vaccination follows a social gradient. So people who are more vulnerable are less likely to be vaccinated even in the US. So bearing that all in mind, if there's an outbreak again, starting uh, in pride season, uh, what are you going to do? How are you going to engage people 
who are uh, who are possibly going to be affected directly, how you were to engage uh, your local and your state departments of health, um, and how what kinds of messages do you think the federal government needs to know from your region about what to do if if MPOX happens again, and I think that's not just an MPOX exercise it's 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 an exercise for the summer yeah in case you know the worst happens hopefully it doesn't but it's also an exercise for coordinating how you respond to sexual health uh in your community knowing that things are so fractured and i'm thinking specifically about the us things are so fractured that um those kind that kind of contact and being organized about contacting different people who each have a stake and figuring out how to structure conversations so that you can problem solve together. I think that's, uh, that's super critical. And that's work that I'm, I'm trying to do um, based on our experience from last year. And if anyone wants to do it with us, because we think we're at the beginning of thinking through how to come up with like a guideline or a report or something, if anyone wants to do that thinking with us, please uh, do contact me. I'll drop my email in the chat again. But thank you. Thank you for this opportunity, Jim. Thank you. It has been such a pleasure to, to listen and learn from you today. Uh, so my gratitude and I think everyone, everyone uh, in the chat and everyone who's been on this call would agree with me. Um, Chloe, same question. Yeah, I think, um, yeah, I think for me, it's really around um, vaccine equity and doing what you can to make sure that uh, vac vaccine equity and vaccine access um because it's not equitable treatment is not e equitable um and it's once again confined to well-resourced countries um so global activism is important we're one world um while one of us is not safe none of us are safe and the other area of act activism is if it happens again and big pop-up vaccination events happen Bear in mind that um, all of the photography that you ever see about vaccines are very long, long queues of white men standing there waiting for the vaccine. And bear in mind what I showed in this data set, which was that 21 out of 382 people actually had been vaccinated as a prevention. That means that our vaccination efforts are not reaching everybody. And we need to make sure that we offer vaccines in a place and in a way that people feel able to take up the offer. And bear in mind that there are other at-risk communities. I think uh, sex workers have been mentioned, and I think we need to make sure that everybody feels that they can step forward and have a vaccine. Thank you. Uh, very smart, very sobering. Um, we're going to close out with, uh, on, a, on a scale of one to 10, regarding your concern for this popping back up in Pride season or this summer, with one being not so concerned, 10 being very, very concerned. Can you each give a, uh, a number in that range with caveats that you may want to add? <laughs> well, uh, my answer is that um, I would give a low level of concern largely because I'm so burnt out that I can't even raise, con I can't find it hard to feel concern and I'll just take it as it comes. If there's, if it happens, I'll be there to try and help. Um, I, I'm finding it hard to predict the future two pandemics in, in terms of levels of concern. I, I sort of take it each day at a time. Um, so I certainly hope it doesn't happen. I wouldn't be surprised if it did happen. I guess that probably means five, but mm -hmm. I don't actually feel concerned. I just feel, I feel concerned about people living with HIV now, today, people with advanced disease and people not testing. Thank you. And Coletto? Um, I, I can't, let me say, I, I won't give a general concern because I'm a hypochondriac. So my concern <laughs> about everything is 10, 11. But um, I am in the position to do something that other people can't do for monkeypox. So for me, I'm at an eight with what I can do in case it's necessary to do what I can do. So I'm preparing as if something big is going to happen in June with the hope that, uh, and with the likelihood that nothing big will happen. But if it does, then at least I'll be prepared. So for folks who are in a position to really shift how monkeypox plays out, I would urge you to uh, spend a little time thinking about if the worst happens, uh, you know, what am I going to do? What can I do? Yeah, I actually think that's great advice. Be prepared, be ready to go, and then be happy and surprised if you don't need to use that preparation. 
And that said, that preparation will not be for naught because organizing your community, addressing equity, uh, doing better to erase disparities and to support people who need better access to care, equitable justice, you know, justice. Um, all of that is always a win. So with that said, I'm gonna thank everyone for being here today. Thank our wonderful presenters. Please give them some love in the chat. Uh, you got love throughout if you were paying attention, but uh, you both really gave such interesting and thoughtful and considered talks. I so appreciate your time and energy. Thank you to everyone who joined us. I look forward to seeing everyone in about a month on April 25th, where we're gonna be talking about multi-purpose technologies that can address HIV, contraception, and STIs. Uh, instead of having one, each area having one, th its own things, imagine bringing them all together. I think that sounds pretty cool. Uh, so with that said, I hope everyone has a good day, good evening, good tomorrow, wherever you are. Uh, keep up the really great work. Take care of yourself when you're feeling burnt out. Take care of yourself. Take care of yourself before, during, and after. Uh, and good day to all of you. Bye-bye.